last night. I was really all over the place, but this is where I started. And I was sharing with people that, you know, next, a week from today is the 50th anniversary of when the Lord touched my life. And the thing that jump-started my whole life was I wanted to know what God's purpose for my life was. I was seeking God. And for a year and a half, I had just been studying the Word. And then on March the 23rd, 1968, God showed up and He uh, touched my life. And man, it just has transformed me. And so last night I was sharing about how that every one of us, before we were even formed in our mother womb, mother's womb, God had written in His book all things that we were going to do. That's not to say that He makes us do that, but He had a plan for our life. You have total choice about whether you follow that plan or not, but God has a plan for you. And one of the reasons that people struggle the way they do is because they're doing their own thing and trying to get God to bless it instead of finding out what God has called you and anointed you to do. So we spent a lot of time about that last night and we had, I didn't count them, but we had hundreds of people stand and say that they had no assurance that they were doing what God called them to do. They were just going through life hoping that they were doing the right things. And I'm, I can tell you, you are not going to accidentally fulfill God's will. You have to know what God's will is. So a lot of people stood last night and made this commitment. So anyway, I could go back and preach on that again. I've got that book that goes into a lot more detail. But I want to go into Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Verse 1 talks about that you have to present your body as a living sacrifice, which that's just your reasonable service. That's the normal Christian duty. This is not just for the fanatics. Every born-again person ought to be 100% sold out, a living sacrifice to the Lord. But that's not all that there is. It says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove. The word prove means to make manifest to the physical senses what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. There are steps and stages, good, acceptable, and perfect. Over in Mark chapter 4, it says first the blade, then the ear, and then, and then the full corn in the ear. There is a growth process. You don't go into God's will all at once. There's steps and stages. But here's what I want to point out. It says that you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the word transform, there's the Greek word metamorpho, and it's a word we get metamorphosis from, where a caterpillar spins a cocoon and then comes out a butterfly. If you want to change from a worm, a caterpillar, to a butterfly, if you want transformation, it comes by the renewing of your mind. Man, this is huge. This is huge, what I'm saying right here. And again, I could spend weeks. Matter of fact, I've got probably dozens or hundreds of scriptures that deal with this area about the renewing of your mind. But people are praying for God's will to come to pass in their life. They're praying for healing. They're praying for prosperity, deliverance. They're praying for all of these things, but they aren't taking the word of God and changing the way they think. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is going the direction of your dominant thought. And there's a lot of people that don't like that statement because you say, oh no, I didn't do this. It was done to me. Well, I admit we've got an enemy that attacks us, but whether it sticks, whether Satan wins or not is dependent upon the way you think. You can overcome if you renew your mind and find your power and authority. I had two or three people that I prayed with this morning who were telling me the problems that they had. And I just asked them, I said, why did you let this happen? <laughs> and they, they just look at me like, I didn't let this happen. It came upon me. I didn't have anything to do with it. No, everything that's happening in your life, you let it happen. That usually goes over about like that. <laughs> Most people want, no, I didn't do this. You don't understand. I was abused. And I admit that Satan can come and attack you, but whether it changes you, whether it makes you a victim is dependent upon the way you think. You have authority over the devil. You have authority over sickness. You have authority over disease. And you may not have sat there and thought, all right, I want cancer. All right, I want multiple sclerosis. You may not have thought that, but you thought that I'm only human. That God, you know, cancer is incurable. Oh, I hope I don't get it. 
you know what? You, your thinking has allowed cancer to come upon you because you haven't taken your authority and power. And I know that by saying this, there's a lot of people right in this room who say, well, you don't have that kind of authority and power. Well, that's the reason that you're susceptible to stuff. It's because you don't understand your authority and power and you don't use it. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, Satan can come knock on the door, but whether he gets in is dependent upon how you're thinking. You have authority over this. You do not have to be sick. You don't have to be poor. You don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be depressed. Do you know, you remember the shooting in Parkland, Florida on Valentine's Day where the guy came in and shot up the place? Well, the coach that shielded a, um, a one of the kids and got killed in the process, but he covered up one of the kids to protect them. It turns out that he and his wife were partners of ours. And she called me this last Tuesday. And I was talking to Melissa, uh, Aaron Fee's Fee's wife. And uh, anyway, I asked her how she's doing. And she was just, oh, I'm wonderful. Man, I'm praising God. She was just praising the Lord. She was shouting the victory. She says, my husband was a hero. And she was celebrating what he did. And one of the reasons she called me is because all of her friends are telling her, you're crazy. You should be falling apart. You should be grieving. You should be brokenhearted. And she misses her husband. She, I'm not saying that she's joyful about the situation, but she is drawing on the power of God and winning victoriously. And there's a lot of people that just, well, you can't do that. That's the reason you fall apart like a $2 suitcase is because you don't believe that. You believe you're only human. You believe that you can't walk supernaturally. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you've got to renew your mind. And it's dangerous if you make a commitment that, God, I want to be a living sacrifice. And if you don't have your mind renewed, you are dangerous. Satan is going to destroy you. You know, I've got some people that I led into the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was in the Baptist church. And these people were awesome people. But they believed in this sovereignty of God. But they had committed themselves that, God, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. They loved God with all of their heart. But they had this doctrine that God controls everything. So if anything bad happened, they just embraced it as this must be God's will. It wouldn't have happened if he didn't allow it. And I saw it literally kill this man. I mean, he embraced sickness thinking it was God's will. God would. I couldn't have had this if it wasn't God's will. And so there's two points, two sides to this. You know, it's like walking or it's like a railroad track. If you only had one rail for that thing to run on, I can guarantee you it's going to wreck. You got to have two rails. You got to have two feet to be able to walk. You got to be a living sacrifice, but at the same time, you have to renew your mind to the truths of God or Satan will eat your lunch and pop the bag. You know, uh, when I got turned on to the Lord, there was a whole group of young people in our church that I influenced and many, many of the people in that uh, group made an absolute commitment of their life to the Lord. And I mean, we were willing to go anywhere, do anything. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, I've told this before, but when I uh, made that commitment on March the 23rd, 1968, Uh, one of the very first things God told me to do was to quit school, which I was in college and I had a student deferment as long as I stayed in school. I had money coming to me and I had the acceptance of people. But God told me to quit uh, university and when I did, I got a draft notice and I went to Vietnam. And and I mean, it could have killed me, but I was willing to do whatever because I was following God to the best of my ability. And if it meant me getting killed in Vietnam, that was fine with me. And I know that there's some people that think, man, you're just saying that, but I meant it. And I proved it by my actions. And I was willing to do anything. And all of these young people that I influenced, they made that same decision. And we were under this false teaching. There was a man, I won't give you his name, but there was a man who was really popular, famous in the Baptist church. And he had a sermon entitled, Satan is God's Messenger Boy. And if you have a problem, it's like, Satan may be the one tempting you, but he's like a dog on a leash. And God, he can only go as far as God will let him go. So if Satan is bothering you, it's because God let him do this to you. God is trying to work something redemptive in your life. So every negative thing that happens to you is God. God is responsible. And that is absolutely wrong. 
but that's what I was under. And uh, long story, but anyway, I went and heard this man and I got his reel-to-reel -reel tapes. This is back before cassette tapes had come out. I got reel-to-reel -reel tapes and I brought them back and I played them for this girl that I was dating. And she, and anyway, on this tape, he gave an example about a young guy who was wanting to witness for the Lord, but he was introverted, he was shy. And so he, um, he just simply prayed and said, God, give me some kind of a cancer so that I could show people I'm not afraid of death and that I could glorify you by me seeking uh, you still even through these things. Now see, that's wrong, but this is a person who loved God to the point that they were willing to sacrifice their life. This is a person who had made themselves a living sacrifice. That part was good, but it was wrong to think that God is the source of this stuff. The Bible says every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, James chapter one. So he was wrong in his theology, but he was right in his heart that he was committed to the Lord. So anyway, he prayed this prayer. The next day he came down with leukemia and he died of leukemia. He was a football player and at his funeral, four people got born again. And this guy was using this as an example of how God gave him leukemia and did this to teach him something and to uh, glorify himself. I brought that back and gave it to this girl and because she had made that same commitment, she wanted to be a living sacrifice, she prayed that same prayer. And she asked God to give her cancer. The next day she passed out, they rushed her to the hospital and she had acute leukemia. And she came down with leukemia. And anyway, I was in Vietnam when she died. They actually, we were just dating, but anyway, her parents said that we were engaged and uh, they got me to come back through the Red Cross and I was with her when she died and she hemorrhaged and strangled to death on her own blood. And guess what? At her funeral, four people got born again. You know what? It was, she was willing to give her life for the Lord, but that wasn't God. And if you don't renew your mind and understand what the Word of God teaches, just saying, oh God, I love you and I'm willing to do anything is dangerous. Satan will take advantage of it. He'll destroy you. I've seen it happen. I've seen people die from this. And you know, before I got my mind renewed in this area, when I got back from Vietnam, Jamie was one of this girl's best friends. And anyway, Jamie and I eventually got married. And the week before we were getting married, uh, we had to go get a physical. You know, I was telling somebody this, and I don't guess they do this nowadays, but you had to get a physical back in those days uh, to get a marriage license. And so I went to get a physical, and it turned out I had, um, oh, yellow jaundice. And it's not life-threatening if you lay flat of your back for six weeks. I was supposed to get married the next week. I was pouring concrete for a living, and there was no way that I was going to lay flat of my back for six weeks. And they said, if you don't, you could become, you could go into a coma and it could actually cause death if you just keep doing it. You got, it's bed rest was the only way that you could deal with it. And I said, I'm not going to do it. And there's a lot of things. I'm trying to hurry up and share all of this, but I had had three dreams. And in these three dreams, or excuse me, it was two dreams. Satan had come to me and he had, he, he was killing me in these dreams. And it was a terrible dream and I'd wake up and think, well, it's only a dream. I remember going in the bathroom and I had, I dreamed that somebody was just jamming their, their fist into my face and beating me up and uh, killing me. And when I went into the bathroom, I had blood all over me. I, it was a demonic attack. And I had rejected these dreams and said, this is not God. And I had rebuked them because they were just so negative. Well, I was 200 miles or, or a, at least 150 miles away from where I lived. I went into a Dairy Queen and a woman from Houston, Texas, which was about 400 miles away from where I lived, was in the Dairy Queen. And she just walked up to me and she says, God speaks once, yea, twice, in visions of the night, in dreams when deep sleep falleth on people. Quotation from the book of Job. She'd never seen me. I've never seen her. And she just walked up and she says, those dreams were from God that you've been rebuking. And man, all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. <laughs> and then this man who preached that message, Satan is God's messenger boy, came to our church. And then I found out that I had yellow jaundice. And if I didn't lay 
down for six weeks. I could go into a coma and it could kill me. And this man started prophesying that God is going to make a human vegetable out of you. You are going to go into a coma for eight years. And he was prophesying all of this gloom and doom over me. And you know what? Jamie and I were sitting there. We went out to eat with this guy and the pastor and about 12 people from the church. And we were all sitting at this big table. And he was just prophesying how God was going to do these things and he was going to break me and do all of this. And because I had made this decision that God, I'll do anything. I'll be whatever. I'm a sacrifice. You know what? A sacrifice doesn't have the ability to choose. I was willing to have God do whatever. And because I was a living sacrifice, I was sitting here accepting this man's prophecy over me. And then the dreams and all of the supernatural things that happened, I was that close to being totally destroyed by this. And I was just sitting there and he was saying all of these things and Jamie and I were just sitting there crying. If this is God's will, it's all right. But the devil, man, he just, you know, if he had stopped right there, you'd have never heard of me. I'd have been dead. But man, he just kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And this guy finally says, you know, the worst part about it all, he had seven incurable diseases in his body at one time. He was, they actually ran an EKG on him and sent it to the lab. And the lab said, you ran an EKG on a corpse. And yet he was standing up and preaching an hour and a half at night. And he was saying it was God that did all of this stuff to him. If he would have just stopped right there, he'd have had me. But then he kept saying, and he says, the worst part about it all is for eight years, God won't let me study the Bible. He's put me on a fast from scripture. <laughs> and I can't study scripture. He wants me to just know him without knowing the word. Now, I didn't know much. <laughs> I was willing to become a human vegetable. I was willing to be a, all of this. But man, I knew that your word, I meditate in it day and night. And when he said that, it's like the scales fall, fell from my eyes. And I stood up in front of him and the pastor and everybody. And I said, that's the devil. I rebuked this. I renounced all of those things. And we got up and walked out of that church and never went back. And we got a lot of flack for it. But man, I didn't know much. But see, it was the renewing of my mind. I knew I had tasted of the word of God. I knew that God would never tell anybody not to study the Bible. And so if I hadn't have known that, if I hadn't have had my mind renewed just a little bit, Satan would have snuffed me out just like this girl that I was engaged to that died because she prayed wrong. Did you know every demon in hell comes when you start praying like that? One of the worst things you can do is pray sometimes. <laughs> and I know some people, oh, that's a terrible thing to say. I've seen it firsthand that prayer can unleash the devil. Satan will take advantage of your prayers. There is a right and a wrong way to pray. I've got a book out there entitled A Better Way to Pray. Matter of fact, the very first thing that Jesus said when he taught on prayer in Matthew chapter 6, he says, don't be like the hypocrites because they love to pray. Hypocrites love to pray. Amen. I've had partners get up and leave when I said stuff like this. I'm not against godly prayer, but I'm just saying just because you start it with Father and end it in Jesus' name does not mean you prayed correctly. You can loose the devil in your life through prayer. And I tell you, I, wrong teaching will destroy you. Satan comes through those things. So you have to have this, both of these things. You have to have a commitment to be a living sacrifice. God, not my will, but your be done. I love you, whatever your will is for me. You have to quit being self-willed. You have to humble yourself. But you also need to renew your mind because if Satan can't stop you from making a commitment to the Lord, then he will take your commitment to the Lord. And if you don't know the truth, he will abuse you with it. And he'll convince you that God is the one who wants you to do these weird things and stuff. You've got to have your mind renewed by the Word of God. God will never, ever violate Scripture. God and the Word agree perfectly. I've had people accuse me of being word-bound, that you're just, you're just bound by the Word of God. 
you can't listen to the Spirit of God <laughs> at all. I had one man that his wife was one that just constantly criticized me. And so she came to me one time and she says, I had a dream about you last night. And she said, we landed on the beaches of Normandy and there was minefields there. And so as we approached these minefields, says, uh, somebody gave us a choice. They said, here's a map and here's a map of where every mine is and you either follow that map or you can just listen to me and I'll talk to you and tell you when to step right, step left, do all of this. Now, which would you rather have? And she says, oh, I chose the voice and you're just bound by this map. And she says, that's a good illustration. You're word bound, but see, I listen to the Holy Spirit. And she thought that was gonna really convict me. I said, man, this is great example because how do you know you're reading the map right? Because you hear this voice telling you how to do it. And I said, it's the spirit and the word that agree. And I said, man, it's not just the spirit because you can hear other voices. How do you know that voice is correct? If the voice and the map both match, man, you got to, you, you're locked in on it. And this is the way that the word of God is. The word of God is given to reveal God's will unto you. And you've got to know the Word of God. You must know the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, if you're going to fulfill God's Word, Satan is going to come against you and attack you and he will come at you with things that are totally demonic and stuff, but he'll also come at you with religious stuff. He will come at you and he will pervert things. Did you know people don't put poison in dog poop? They put poison in stuff that you would eat. And Satan doesn't only come and say, Jesus isn't God, don't follow him. But he'll take some truth and he'll pervert it and poison it. He came, you know, Creflo was talking about Matthew chapter 4 where Satan came and tempted Jesus. And one of the things he did was quote scripture. He quoted from Psalms chapter 91, but he misquoted it. He says... Throw yourself down from this temple for it is written that the Lord will give his angels charge over thee and they will bear thee up in your hands lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. There was two mistakes that he made. It says he will give his angels charge over thee to keep you in all of your ways. In other words, when you're following what God is telling you, there is a divine protection. And then it says, and Satan said that he, they will bear you up in your hands lest at any time you dash your foot against stone. That lest at any time isn't in Psalms chapter 91. See, he added to and he took away part of it. And by doing that, he perverted it. And he was trying to use scripture on Jesus. I guarantee you, if Satan used that on Jesus, how much more will he use it on you? You need to know what the word of God says. And you need to not just have a casual acquaintance with it. You need to know what the word of God says. The Word of God is the will of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of Him. How do you know what God's will is? Right here, this Word is His will. You've got to know the Word of God. You need to pray according to the Word of God. You know, during this little clip that Jeff did for us this morning, the man was saying that he's learned not to just ask God, but to claim. In other words, it, once you find out that you've already got it, that God's already done his part, then instead of you having to ask God to heal you, it says by his stripes you were healed. You just stand and receive what is already yours and then you take your authority. You resist the devil and he will flee from you. And people aren't resisting. They're sitting there, oh God, would you please take this away? And then they embrace this sickness. And somebody says, how are you? They start talking about how bad they feel. They ignore the scriptures. It says death and life are in the power of the tongue. They say, oh, I'm dying. I've got pain all through my body. And you're hung by your own tongue because you don't know what the word of God says. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we've got to renew our minds. So this is a two-step process. You've got to be a living sacrifice. You've got to seek and desire God's will and say, God, I want your will. You've got to sacrifice your own ambitions. But then you've also got to renew your mind. Be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. And the Word of God is what He gave us to renew our mind. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Then when? When you meditate in this law day and night. And again, like I said last night, in a sense I'm preaching to the choir. You're the people that are here on Friday morning. You're the fanatics. But man, we need to be steeped in the Word of God. The Word of God needs to literally dominate and control us. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Carnal mindedness equals death. If you are experiencing death, and death is not only ceasing to breathe, ceasing to exist, but Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Anything that comes as a result of sin is death. Sickness, poverty, depression, bitterness, hurt, pain, all of those things are forms of death. The wages of sin is death. If you are experiencing death in your life, it's because you have not been spiritually minded. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I can tell what you've been doing by what's growing in your life. Amen. Amen. It's tight, but it's right. And again, our society is masters at passing the buck. Oh, but you don't understand. I was abused when I was a child. You don't understand. I don't have the education. It's the color of my skin. We got excuses for every rotten thing in our life and blame somebody else. But the bottom line is, as you think in your heart, that's the way that you are. You, until you start taking responsibility for your own actions, you'll always be a victim. Sure, people do things to you. Sure, bad things happen to good people, but You've got a choice whether you become bitter or better. And the Word of God will teach you how to cast down these imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You can do that. That's our spiritual weapon. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And so we've got to meditate in the Word. And I'm telling you, the Word will just change you. Let me share this with you out of Mark chapter 4. If you've watched my television programs this last week, I was talking about some of this. But in Mark chapter 4 and in verse 26, Jesus gave a parable and he was talking about the Word of God and how it works. And he said in Mark 4, 26, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. Before I get into this parable, let me just share with you that the Lord used a natural law, a natural system that He created. This is important because if He would have used some man-made system, well then man-made things can be circumvented. They can be uh, cheated. You can use a shortcut, like in school. I bet you every one of us, there was times that we didn't pay attention, but you waited until the night before a test and you crammed for a test and you stored the information in your short-term memory and you passed the test, but today you couldn't pass that test if your life depended on it. You didn't learn it, you beat the system. But you know what, you can't cram for a harvest. You, you can't wait until the night before a harvest and go plant your seed and get a result. I was telling our Bible college students yesterday that I actually had a man in one of my Bible studies who got born again and he had been the worst sinner in all of Baca County. And uh, when he got born again, he got on the full gospel circuit, went to preaching and stuff, and he didn't have time to plant his seed because he was too busy for the Lord. So he just assumed that God would give him a supernatural harvest. And he went out and the week before wheat harvest, he borrowed $500,000 worth of wheat and planted, I forget, 20, uh, not 20, but two or three sections of land, 640 acres per section. And he planted all of this wheat seed and when it didn't come up and he had no harvest and he had to pay $500,000 for the seed that he had just planted, he came to me and he was mad at God. Why did God let this happen? I was out preaching the gospel. Why didn't my wheat come up? And I said, because you planted it one week before wheat harvest. 
It doesn't work. There's laws that govern it. You have to obey it. And that's, that's one of the reasons that God used this example of a seed because there is seed time and then harvest. And most people aren't willing to do this. They just want to come up here and have the minister, the man of God pray over you and wave your hand over you and you're going to get healed supernaturally. But you don't want to take time and plant the word of God and renew your mind. When the Bible says, Proverbs chapter four, that the word is health unto all of your flesh and life unto those that find it. If you'd take the seed of God's word and put it in your heart and give it time, it would supernaturally produce. So he says in verse 27, and he should sleep and rise night and day and, he, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. Man, that's one of my favorite statements right there. Because when the Lord told me to quit school, everybody told me God will never use you unless you go to cemetery, I mean seminary and you learn and all this stuff and God can't use you. And man, I, I depended on this. God, I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer. I don't know how it works, but I know that if I put this word in my heart, it's going to work. You don't have to understand the whole thing. And in verse 28, it says, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Do you know that this says that the earth brings forth fruit of herself? This phrase, of herself, is the Greek word automatos, and it's the word we get automatic from, or automatically. Did you know that this is just automatic? It works every time. You take a seed and you put it in ground, and if the ground is the right temperature, and if it's got moisture, there is just a miracle that takes place between this seed and this ground. They've actually taken seeds that were in the Pharaoh's tombs for 4,000 years and nothing has happened and they've planted them and boom, they grow. It's miraculous. And it just happens automatically. The ground is our heart. And notice here, it didn't say that the seed brings forth. It says the ground brings forth. This is something I just, it just dawned on me about a year ago that, you know, we'll sit there and say this little acorn, did you know that there's a huge oak tree in this acorn? That's not true. The acorn has something in it that God created, but it activates the ground. It's the ground that produces the oak tree. It's the ground, it's the earth that brings forth fruit. God created dirt with supernatural stuff in it. I've had a person tell me, you are as plain as dirt. Now I take that as a great compliment, amen? Because dirt is awesome. You know, when, if you go back to the book of Genesis, God created, there's three different words used for creation in Genesis 1 and 2. One means to create from nothing. That's Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created from nothing, the heavens and the earth. But then... There's another Greek uh, Hebrew word that's used and it means to create from something that already exists, to form. And then there's a third word that means to build. When it says that he created Eve, he took that rib and created her, that word means to build. So did you know technically when you say that woman is really built, that's a very scriptural term. <laughs> It may not be used in the right way, but it is scriptural, amen. But my point is, he created everything from nothing. He created dirt, and then from the dirt, it says out of the ground, he formed every beast of the field. Did you know God did not create them individually? He had them in dirt. In dirt was elephants and tigers and lions and every animal was in the dirt and our body, he created our body out of dirt. He didn't create it from nothing. It was already in the dirt. Everything that's in the human body came from dirt and when you die, this body goes back to dirt. But my point is, see, God didn't make a new creation. He just took what he had already created, what was already in dirt and formed it into all of these animals, into our bodies. The potential was already in that dirt. And you know, dirt, it's just miraculous. You can put a fence post 
in dirt. Did you know that dirt will start eating that, that fence post? It'll, if you leave it there, it'll literally eat that fence post trying to give life to it. They're just, I mean, this is miraculous, the way that God created things. Think how much dirt there is in the earth. And yet that dirt has the potential. I mean, it is supernatural, but it needs something, a catalyst to activate it. And that's what the seed is. The seed somehow or another activates that ground. If you had barren ground, if you had ground that had been sowed with salt or something like that, did you know that that seed won't do anything? It, the seed just activates the ground. And if the ground is barren, if it's lacking nutrients, it will stunt what that seed can do. So the seed is the word of God. The ground is your heart. And brothers and sisters, in your born again spirit, God has already placed everything that you will ever need. You, you've got it all. You are complete in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. You are already complete. The average Christian is praying and asking God to do something when the truth is when you got born again, God put everything within you. All you need is a seed to draw that out. And that's what the Word of God is. If you would renew your mind by the Word of God, be transformed through the renewing of your mind, you would prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. The Word of God is just essential and I am shocked when people come to me and ask for something and I'll say, well, what scripture are you standing on? And most of the time they don't have a clue or they'll say something like, well, doesn't the Bible say somewhere that by his stripes we were healed? By his stripes we are healed or were healed. Is that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? You know, that's like a woman wanting to get pregnant and she just goes stands next to a man and thinks that'll do it. <laughs> That's not how it works. You got to plant a seed. The scripture says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God that lives and abides forever. And the word for seed there is spora, the Greek word spora, where we get spores from. That's how a flower pollinates. And spora is a derivative of the Greek word sperma, where we get the word sperm from. In the same way that you have to plant a seed in order to have a child. We would think a woman is absolutely crazy who's praying for a child but will not have a physical relationship with a man. That's not how it happens. I've prayed for hundreds, thousands of people who were barren to have children. But then after I pray, I say, God's doing his part. You do your part, <laughs> amen. You go home and act on the word of God. But you aren't going to have a virgin birth. There was only one virgin birth. You got to have a seed that's sown. And if a woman was trying to get pregnant without having a seed sown, you'd think she's crazy. And yet how many Christians are trying to receive from God and you haven't sown the seed? Oh, God, heal me. Well, what scripture is saying? Well, I don't know. Uh, that's like, uh, you know, could I just drink this water after a woman who is pregnant? Will that work? No, amen. You're going to have to have personal interaction, personal contact. You need to know the word. It needs to conceive on the inside of you. And if you put these two things together, if you become a living sacrifice, which is just your reasonable duty, and then you renew your mind according to the Word of God, I can guarantee you, you'll be transformed from something that's earthbound to something that can fly, something that's ugly to something that's beautiful. Man, God will change your life but brothers and sisters, we're asking God to do what he told us to do. He told us to renew our mind, not to be conformed to this world. Did you know in Romans 12 too, the word conformed there means to pour into the mold of. The world is trying to melt you and conform you, pour you into the mold of thinking like everybody else. And the sad thing is most Christians have adopted it. It's just wrong. You know, they asked me to write a little um, thing for the paper about Billy Graham's death. And I wrote and I said, man, this was the greatest day of Billy Graham's life. And people thought that was weird. But then at Billy Graham's funeral, I heard him 
they, they were reading something from him and he says, someday people will tell you that Billy Graham died. He says, don't you believe it. He says, I am more alive than I have ever been in my life. Now see what that's doing. That's not being conformed to the way the world thinks. The world thinks that you're dead. It's over. That that's it. And they just think about sadness and how terrible this is. But I guarantee you, a person that knows the Lord, they aren't, they aren't ceasing to exist. They are more alive than they have ever been. And if you actually start thinking of things properly, did you know that death is a great thing? And I know that some people, oh, no, it's not. God didn't make us to die. I agree. He, he never intended us to die. But once sin has entered this world, just think what it'd be like if every vile person who's ever existed on this planet was still alive. Think about if Hitler, Genghis Khan, and on and on you could go naming people. What if they were all still alive? You couldn't get rid of them. What if a person who had some kind of a birth defect and was blind or deaf or mentally affected or just in constant pain and on and on and on you can go. Living forever in this fallen world would be a curse. For those who accept salvation, man, Paul said, for me to depart and be with Christ is far better and on and on we could go with the scriptures. For those who know the Lord, we should think differently. We shouldn't be conformed to the way that the world thinks. We shouldn't fear death. We ought to actually look at it as this is gonna be the best day of my life. The best part of living is dying because I'm gonna to go to be with the Lord and everything I've wanted and prayed for and sought is gonna become a reality. I do not fear death. Now I'm not submitting to it because I've got a job to do. But I guarantee you, I am not afraid of death. And Billy Graham, I heard him talk about that. See, for a Christian, it's different. If you take the Word of God and if you plant that seed, it changes your worldview. It changes the way you look at things. Instead of being afraid when the doctor says, you're going to die. Man, if you understood, Paul said, for me to die is gain. It'd be all you could do to keep from just reaching up and kissing that doctor. <laughs> Say, man, this is awesome news. Amen. But see, most people don't think that way because they are conformed to the way the world thinks. Most of us spend more time in the light of our TV than we do in the light of the Word. And I'm telling you, you got to get into the Word. You got to renew your mind. You got to begin to see things differently. And brothers and sisters, if you do, it's an incorruptible seed. It will always change you. I've got an entire teaching entitled Effortless Change, which sounds like it's impossible, but that's the way that a seed works. If you plant a seed and if you give it the right nourishment and time, it just automatically brings forth fruit. It automatically works. It's effortless. You've never heard an apple tree groan, moan, scream, yell. Ugh, here's an apple. <laughs> it's just the nature of that apple seed. It activates the ground and it just happens naturally. If it seems like you're struggling and change is so hard, it's so hard to be healed. It's because you're trying to pray and get healed from the outside instead of taking the Word of God and planting it in your heart and let the Word of God just bring healing. There's some of you that are praying for prosperity. I'm telling you what, Creflo sharing, I, I'm so excited to listen to him the rest of the time because he's talking about it's just trusting God. And when you get your heart right and when you receive this word, prosperity, you attract prosperity. You don't have to pursue it. Money is attracted. You become a money magnet once you get your heart right. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, that God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. If you are short of seed, this isn't talking about physical seed, it's talking about using money. It's talking about money and using an illustration of a seed. If you are short of money, it's because God doesn't see you as a giver. If God saw you as a giver, He'd give seed to sowers. But most people are takers. Most people, it's me, my four and no more and you build a wall around you and protect everything you've got, if you build a dam, man, God's not gonna flow through you. But when, if you can open up and let it flow through, one hand to receive and one hand to give, and as the money flows through, there's plenty for you. If you can get that attitude, man, God, if God can get it through you, He will get it to you. 
you will see supernatural prosperity. But see, it's, it's based on the way you think, and that's what the Word of God affects. The Word of God is God's way of thinking. And brothers and sisters, it's contrary to this world. Wendell and I were talking at breakfast today, and we were talking about some things, and, and we just said, you know, it is amazing how that very few people let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. Most people... This is what they believe. This is what they were taught. They were raised this way. And who cares what the Bible says? How dare you let the Bible get in the way? I was painting a woman's house one time when I was pastoring in, in uh, Childress, Texas. And she was a Baptist lady. And I was talking to her about the Lord the whole time. And anyway, after a whole week, I'd witnessed to her and taught, told a lot of things. And finally she says, why did you leave the Baptist church? We need nice young men like you in the Baptist church. And I said, well, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they told me to leave. They kicked me out of the church. And she says, what are you talking about? Are you talking about speaking in tongues? And I said, yeah. I said, I spoke in tongues and they told me to leave. And she said, well, they'd kicked you out of my Baptist church too. And I said, well, how can you say that? And I turned over to 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 14, verse 39, where it says, forbid not to speak with tongues. And I said, right here, it says, forbid not to speak in tongues. And she looked at me just as serious as she, she could be. She says, there's lots of things in the Bible that we don't believe. <laughs> and when she said that, it's like, how do you talk to a person that just, I don't care what the Bible says. I've had people in my school that get on me and say, how can you be against abortion and things like this? Everybody's got their own free choice and everything. And I'll say, but the Bible says, and it's like, they don't care what the Bible says. This is what I've been taught. This is the way we've lived. I can feel a few of you recoiled on that one. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to get to where it doesn't matter what your family has said, what they've done for generations. What does the Word of God say? If you will make a commitment of your life to the Lord and then say, Father, I'm going to renew my mind and whatever your Word says, I'll be dominated by the Word. I'll be controlled by the Word. You put those two things into motion and here's the way the Lord said it to me back in 1968. He says, if you make yourself a living sacrifice and then if you renew your mind by the Word of God, you would have to backslide on me to keep from proving the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It totally changed the direction of my life. I had been praying, oh, God, use me. God, use me. And finally, the Lord spoke to me and said, the reason I'm not using you is because you aren't usable. He says, quit praying that I'll use you. Make yourself usable by being a living sacrifice and renew your mind. He told me, just stick your nose in the Word and the Word will teach you. It'll do everything that you need done. And I'm telling you, there's people that are, it's just like, oh God, how do I get from where I am and where I'm supposed to be? You become a living sacrifice and you renew your mind according to the Word. You give it time. You sleep and rise night and day and the Word will just automatically make this ground your heart just bring forth. It will, it will draw out of you the awesome things that God has put in you. It's automatic. But you have to start the process. That seed is powerful, but it has to be planted in the ground and you have to leave it there. You can't plant the ground, plant the seed in the ground and dig it up and see if anything's happened and then replant it. You got to leave it there. You can't just seek the Lord for one weekend right here and man, I'm going to get into the Word and then when you go back, you just get as carnal as you can be and start thinking the way you were thinking before. You got to abide there. It says that just live by faith. They don't vacation there. It's not a weekend retreat. You live there. This is where you dwell. You live by it. If the Word says it, just do it. Amen. Amen. Man, what I'm saying is so simple, you gotta have somebody to help you to misunderstand it. <laughs> but we've had a lot of help misunderstanding this, and I'm just encouraging you that, man, I believe that this weekend, what I'm sharing, what Creflo is sharing, I believe God brought you here to renew your mind. And, and even though this can make an impact on you, this is not gonna change you the rest of your life unless you take this 
and just amplify, build upon it. Use this as a foundation. You've got to get into the Word on your own. You've got to get to where you can feed yourself. You know, you can come here and we can spoon feed you and help you and get you started, but ultimately you got to feed yourself. And somebody, somebody's saying, well, I just don't understand the Bible. Man, the Holy Spirit is sent to instruct you. It says that He will teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, lead you into all truth, whatsoever I've spoken unto you. John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit will reveal the Word. He's the one that wrote it. It's not written to your brain. It's written to your heart. And if you would get before God and just say, Oh God, help me, speak to me. And get rid of your religious ideas and tradition. Open your heart up. You know, I used to have a thing where I read through, and I had to read the Bible two or three times a year from start to end. Now, let me say that when you're first getting started, that's good to do because you can't meditate on things that you don't know. So you've got to put the information in there. But ultimately, it's not about the volume of Scripture that you read. It's about how much you get out of what you're reading. And I remember one time that I was starting to read and I said, Oh God, I ask you to speak to me through the Word. And then I started reading and by the second verse, God was showing me some things that I hadn't seen before. But I just shut those thoughts down thinking, man, I've got two more chapters to read. <laughs> and I started reading and, and I was going on and the Lord spoke to me and He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading the Word. And he says, why are you doing it? So that you can speak to me. <laughs> and then He didn't say anything. <laughs> and I got to thinking, He was speaking to me. And I said, <laughs> said, God, don't talk to me now. I'm reading the Bible. I've got two <laughs> more chapters to go. Man, if you, you know, it's great to read five chapters a day or whatever, but if God speaks to you on the first verse, just stop and let God speak to you. The purpose of the Word is to receive from God. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. Thank you. We receive the Word of God. Father, thank you for giving us the Bible. Thank you for the people who've died and put their life on the line to translate the Bible when it wasn't popular. Father, thank you for all of the people that have given their life and their effort to bring the Word of God into our lives. And Father, we just make a decision to receive this Word, to receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save our souls. Father, we receive this and we believe that our heart will just bring forth fruit, forth, fruit, forth, fruit, forth, fruit, forth, fruit, forth, fruit. Forth, fruit, forth, fruit. Fruit.